you. We're working on the technology. Uh, uh, the honest truth is, I really actually, I, I tell you a secret, I prefer it without the technology, but I do understand the technology helps to visualize uh, this. So we're working on getting the technology up. Uh, and I hope you're going to enjoy what we've got to talk about today, which is the subject of uh, uh, celebrities. So whatever that will mean in the 1920s is what we're going to talk about today. And then next week we're going to talk about nativism, uh, the rise of the KKK in the 1920s, uh, the fear that people got into. Uh, we'll save the next week for religion, focusing on the Scopes trial, and then in, in, um, on our sixth class with the crash of the stock market, the economy and the crash of the stock market. So that's kind of the lay of the land, and uh, we'll see how closely I'm able to follow it. Aha! Now, today, uh-oh, we're missing one. And you know, I actually really like this room. It's my favorite room. I know for y'all it's the hardest room to get in, but I do like having y'all this way rather than back and beyond there. So we're going to try this one more time here. Now I do, I was asked, I was asked by one of you to make an announcement about when I'm going to talk about nothing but woman suffrage. And that is on May the 2nd, which is a Wednesday afternoon at 5.30 at the Fort Negley Visitor Center. It's totally free. It's the annual uh, lecture of the Tennessee Historical Society. Uh, there's great parking there because the, the Fort Negley is now able to use Greer Stadium parking. And so we've got lots of parking there, and it's an easy entrance. Uh, there, are, there is uh, one way you can get in uh, without any steps, and, there, and then the other way, uh, there, there are about oh, maybe six or eight steps, but not a lot of steps. So uh, uh, that, will be, that will be no longer than an hour. And uh, if you haven't been over there lately, uh, you'll probably enjoy uh, just looking around. They keep putting up some exhibits and are now hoping to do some more here. Now, ha, da, 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 all three showing here. Uh, this may or may not last. Now, we'll see, we'll see, who knows. Uh, First of all, I want to start by talking a little bit about the United States in 1920, in the 20s, and what somebody coming to our country might uh, imagine or might think as they come, because I think it's really, as I've emphasized from day one, the United States came out of World War I, the Great War, ahead. We went in and became out richer. The other nations continued to suffer. And so people would see all sorts of things if they came to this country. In the 26.8 million households in the United States in 1920, uh, 11 million households had phonographs. Now that assumes that if you have a phonograph, you're also buying records. So there is a new consumable that you can spend your money on now, which is records. 10 million homes have a car. Soon they're going to have two cars. 17.5 million homes have a telephone, and the telephones were being added at the rate of over 700 households a year. Things were booming here. We were 42nd of, uh, we, in, in terms of all the goods that were being manufactured in the entire world, the United States was now 42nd. And we were, I mean, not 42nd, we were producing 42% of all manufactured goods made in the world. Now, let me re say that so you can think about today. 42% uh, of all manufactured goods in 1920 were produced in the United States. That's a lot. And when you consider how little we're producing now, it would seem that that is quite a striking number. Uh, the United States produced 80% of all the movies that were being shown in America and the rest of the world as well. Uh, people were watching the movies. 
People were riding around. They were going places. We were just a more <clears throat> affluent nation every way, everywhere you looked. The economy was booming, and we as individuals were. Probably the 1920s are, <clears throat> are really a golden age for reading, for publishing, and especially for newspapers. Every household in America took at least one, almost every household in America took at least one paper. Even out in rural areas, they got a newspaper, even if it was a day late, they got it in their regular mail. They also got the progressive farmer. If they were Christians, they got some kind of weekly or monthly magazine, generally from their denomination, and people read these things and devoured them even though the radio had come along. And, and publishers quickly recognized the opportunities here to produce more things for people to read. So it's no coincidence, and why does that not want to work? Well, I guess I'll use the old-fashioned way. Perhaps it's not hooked up. How about that? Um, I'll use the old-fashioned clicker here. Um, it's no coincidence that it's in the 20s that some publishers come up with the idea of a book club, convincing you to buy a book a month. Don't have enough time to read? They will pick the books and send them for you. So we have the Book of the Month Club coming along fairly quickly. Uh, they have all sorts of literature and things to sell you. Well, right on their hills will be the Literary Guild, which will even have a junior league so that we can take advantage of those children and the children's market for reading. Now, magazines really take off during the 20s. Reader's Digest comes along in the 20s, and it will be booming. Can you guess what publication? Not a weekly or just the printed thing that would have better readership than the Reader's Digest. They printed more the Bible. So there's lots and lots of publications out there. Time Magazine comes along, and it really uh, it is not the Time Magazine that you all know. And, and remember so well from the 80s and 90s, it was started by two Yale students, Henry Luce and Britton Hatton. And in its early days, it was wildly inaccurate. <laughs> Lots of mistakes. Now here is one example that Bill Bryson gave that I think is quite charming. Uh, Charles Nungesser, was described in the New York Times, in the, in the Times Magazine, he was describing as having lost in the Great War, World War I, an arm, a leg, and a chin. <laughs> Not only was that incorrect, but the picture of him was in the newspaper with a full set of arms and legs and, guess what, a chin. Uh, the, the publishers really got kind of into this and they loved certain words, so these become the overused words in America that everybody's using. Swart, nimble, gimlet-eyed. They like to change phrases and distort them. In the nick of time became in time's nick. And honestly, until I read Bill Bryson's book, I did not know the word uh, neologisms, but perhaps some of you do. If you work complicated crossword puzzles, you might. But they like to take two words and sort of combine them into uh, a, a, a new words. So instead of a person who liked the, the going to movies or the coins here today, uh, yes, okay, instead of people who like going to movies, they're cinematics. And uh, they enjoyed that, and people kind of enjoyed this, and they kept buying it, even though uh, they knew that many things were inaccurate. Now, here comes...
comes another young up-and-comer. One idea spawns another. Another Time came out in 23. In 1924, here comes the American Mercury. And the American Mercury, one of the co-editors, is none other than H.L. Mencken. Now this is 1924. He has a flair with a pen, so to speak, and he's going to make a visit the next year to our beautiful state. He is coming to Tennessee. <laughs> I couldn't resist putting this in. Uh, no, this does not come along till the 1930s, but he didn't see so many th beautiful things in Tennessee. He described us as a very backward state in a very backward part of the country uh, in the two weeks or so he spent in Dayton, which is a beautiful little town right on the river there. So he did not get to go see Rock City because the Carter family had not yet figured out that car tourism was all the rage and coming and they decided to capitalize on automobile vacation uh, travelers in the country. So here we've got magazines booming. Out comes the New Yorker in 1925. Uh, people loved the New Yorker, as far as I can tell. People still love the New Yorker. Uh, they, with lots of, uh, my postman has lots of subscriptions to the New Yorker he, from time to time, or she gets them mixed up, so we get somebody's New Yorker. It's not necessarily ours, but we do get our New Yorker uh, every week. And then, you know, the game between my husband and me is trying to guess what the cartoon on the front, the image on the front cover, is all about. Now, Richard Simon is a young man who is out of college and with a friend. They have started a little publishing business. Now, what does he do generally on Sunday? He goes to visit his elderly aunt. And she is, guess what she's doing? She's working a crossword puzzle that appears only once a week in one of the New York newspapers. And so she tells her charming nephew that wouldn't it be nice to have more crossword puzzles that she could work puzzles on days other than just on Sunday. Well, guess what? He goes back to his partner and they come up with the idea of a crossword puzzle book. Now, I still see people working crossword puzzles, and I know Carol Ann went to visit my mother uh, not too long before she died, and my mother at age 92 was still working crossword puzzles. And uh, the, there, are, there are some of us that, that try them occasionally, but we don't do it enough. We don't practice enough to be able to get the hang of the clues and the things that are out there. But, <coughs> excuse me, uh, it, it was quite the rage, and the publishing of this book with his partner, Max Schuster, really gets Simon and Schuster on, off and running. And suddenly there are lots of crossword puzzle books out there, and not only are there crossword puzzle books, but uh, people are, are buying things that go with crossword puzzle books. Dictionaries, thesauruses. People never seem to want a thesaurus unless they were writers. Well, now every household that's going to have a crossword puzzle worker is going to have to have a crossword puzzle book. And Simon and Schuster came up with a really clever little publishing uh, scheme to build anticipation for the coming of the crossword puzzle book. Now, they first started with these two products that they had published something or another about. Emile Coué was a French psychologist and pharmacist, and he had come up with a kind of uh, psychotherapy that I think you and I would call the power of positive thinking. You focus on a little phrase, and every time I hear about hear this phrase, I immediately uh, think of an Al Franken character on Saturday Night Live when he played Stuart Smalley, I'm good enough, I'm good enough, and gall darn it, I'm proud of myself, or something to that effect. So every day in every way, I am getting better. 
And if you repeat that enough time, it will improve your disposition. So this is the, the way they, saw, they, they introduced the crossword puzzle book. 1921, it was psychotherapy and these ideas, auto-suggestion. 1922, it was instructions for the game of Mahjong, which was an ancient game. It had been in Europe for a while, but it wasn't introduced in the United States, as I understand it, until 1920. And you need instructions if you're going to have if you're going to have, what is it, 144 tiles? There, there's a lot of different, different looking things in the Mahjong game. So in 1922, it was Mahjong. In 1923, it was, yes, we have no bananas. And in 1924, it was the crossword puzzle book, which immediately was all the rage. And these first books actually came with a pencil attached. <laughs> so you are getting uh, value for your money here if you buy one of these crossword puzzle books. Everybody is producing them, and the newspapers love the crossword puzzles and start uh, running them not only on Sundays, but also on, on uh, every day of the week. Uh, there were lots of stories about people who became addicted to crossword puzzle working. Uh, one man in New York City was reportedly arrested in a restaurant because he sat there for four hours and refused to leave until he had finished the crossword puzzle he was working on. Mary Zaba of Chicago told people that she was a crossword puzzle widow because her husband was apparently so busy working crossword puzzles that he uh, neglected going to work to support her. So she was quite grieved. And one Pittsburgh preacher actually, now I don't know how you would do this, uh, especially knowing the length of sermons in the 1920s and 30s and 40s and 50s, he put his whole sermon on a crossword puzzle one Sunday. And I'm sure that the congregation took their time getting that one worked out. So all the trains now have crossword puzzle books. They have things out there for travelers uh, to, to places where they can put their book down and work on the crossword puzzles. And people, commuters in and out of New York City, are constantly working crossword puzzles on their way to and from work uh, as they sit in, in, on the train waiting for it to get to their destination. Anybody you met on the street suddenly could tell you who the Egyptian sun god was. <laughs> it was that kind of information that was out there. Now, it began, it began it, you know, cr these are fads we're talking about. And fads have a peak, and then they start kind of trickling down. And so the next fad that comes along and surpasses crossword puzzle books are question and answer books. Questions are little word games and fill-in-the-blank games. And so this is really becomes the forerunner of all the game shows that we have on television uh, that involve uh, information, uh, uh, being able to come up with information and things that are important. Okay, these are pretty interesting things. Well, can you figure out another way to make money with the printed word? Well, yes, you can. Tabloids. Uh, this idea had already come from, this came from London. It was not a new idea at all, but uh, in the United States, they were a little later to take off. The first uh, 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 tabloid in the United States was the Illustrated Daily News, and it was two cents a, a, a paper. It was a hit. People loved it. At one point, it was selling more on any given day than the New York Times. Well, not to be outdone, here comes Bernard McFadden. Now, yes, he decided he needed a cuter name than Bernard, what his mother had given him. And so he put an R, he replaced the D on the end of his name with an extra R, and he changed MC 
Fadden to M.A.C. Fadden, and so he was quite a character. This guy made three different fortunes, and he undoubtedly was the most eccentric person ever in publishing. He was very much into vegetarianism and bodybuilding, bodybuilding, and this is, you can find this on your home computer too. I don't have the pictures to show you. This is an educational institution. Uh, but he, he and his wife did calisthenics and bodybuilding in their yard in the nude, which offended some of the neighbors. <laughs> now, if you think it was, it was amusing when after the Musica statues were put in, uh, in uh, the uh, circle there, the traffic circle, and we suddenly saw them uh, with modesty pieces on. Imagine what the neighbors would think if the other neighbors are out there doing exercises. So he starts a chain of health farms. What in my, in my childhood, I can really remember very distinctly when somebody opened in Fannin County what my grandmother called a nudist camp. And of course, uh, that just, just piqued my brother and my curiosity as to where this might be, but neither of us were old enough to drive, so we never, never, never saw if it really was true or not. But he starts focusing on juicy stories. And he publishes the magazine that all folks want to read, at least a certain demographic. This appealed to a certain demographic of young women. And he sells these things like hotcakes. They are very popular. Uh, people like it. Uh, here is uh, 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 just some, some examples of what these things look like, some of the stories, and this will gradually get, get, get uh, more exciting and more exciting. There, there's always at least sexual innuendo, if not outright sex here. While my husband was away. Look at those eyes and you've got that cat there. Uh, mm, that is definitely suggestive, isn't it? Ah, oh, New York murdered my son. I murdered the woman I loved. And you know, uh, I will admit this to you, uh, as recently as yesterday when I was in a local grocery store, when I'm waiting, I, I read all the headlines on all the tabloids. And it's quite interesting to wonder if this is where some people get exclusively their news, because Angelina Jolie is kind of dying down, Brad Pitt is still there, and Jennifer Aniston, but Blake Shelton has just risen on every one of those. And yesterday, while standing in the checkout line at the grocery store, I saw that Blake Shelton was really uh, showing a tremendous amount of sadness that he had never been able to have a child. And then two, two tabloids down there, before you get to put your stuff on the scanning thing, uh, this two, two tabloids down is Blake and whoever the woman is, you all will know her, somebody will know her name, uh, uh, they, Gwen, uh, they are now having a baby. So, I mean, which of these do you believe? And of course, you know, we've, we're learning more than we ever wanted to know uh, about Princess Kate's upcoming delivery. So look at these things, and they wouldn't be there if people didn't buy them and read them. They are not there for you and me to laugh at. They are there to, for somebody or another to make money with. So he goes into this in a big way. After having so much success with True Confessions, he tries his own paper, which is the Evening Graphic, which comes out in 1926. And I think this is, is really the forerunner of totally fake news. It wasn't John Stewart. It was, uh, you all know who John Stewart is? Okay. All right, I, I thought he was funny myself, but perhaps. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, he comes out, Mr. McFadden comes out with this idea, and he makes it pretty 
openly clear to anybody that asked. People don't ask him much, but he makes it clear that these stories had very little truth in them. But people didn't care. They bought these things and read them. So when Rudolph Valentino died, there was a whole series of articles communicating with communications from Rudolph Valentino from the grave. People were very interested in the occult here. And this man was Mr. Photoshop before anybody had a computer or even thought of Photoshop. Now, even I can tell that perhaps those heads on those people do not exactly fit with their bodies. Now, these were what he called the composograph, and he uh, pasted pictures together and then published them this way. And one of his most popular stories was a story about Big Daddy uh, Browning and he, his marriage to a 16-year-old girl whom he called Peaches. And the reason this gets so much coverage is that after a while, uh, there is a request for an annulment here. And uh, so you suddenly, are, people are buying this and people know as much about Peaches and Daddy Browning as you and I know about the Kardashians today. <laughs> so this is popular. There is nothing here that's going on in 2018 that hasn't been seen in some form or fashion before. So these years are called the Ballyhoo years by lots of different people. But really what this really refers to is just this, this insatiable uh, market for exaggerated information. Uh, people will, will want publicity for inconsequential things and they will get publicity for inconsequential things. So, you know, you'll hear the phrase like, after all the ballyhoo, the movie was a flop. After all this great anticipation and publicity, the movie was a disaster. So we get lots of information about murder trials, particularly if they involve a, a, a couple who are married and a third party, a lover of either one of the partners in a marriage. People absolutely desire, devour these stories. Uh, there are two or three that really got a lot of attention and I'm not going to spend any time on these, but I do think that if you want to go home and look these up on your computer, you will enjoy reading some of the information about these. And here is a murder, uh, the Snyder Gray couple. Mrs. Snyder is married to another man and she has a lover. And so they come up with a plan to murder Mr. Snyder. And it's a very elaborate thing. They take a window sash. Now that's not something you tie around curtains. It's the mechanism that allows you to, it's a heavier item to pull the, the, the window up and down to maneuver the window. They take that, they take some framing wire, ring it around his neck, beat him with this window sash, and then uh, they concoct and leave some notes uh, that uh, somebody, an intruder had come in, had stolen Mrs. Snyder's jewelry. The story is quite an elaborate one. Needless to say, it doesn't take the police very long to figure out who committed this murder. And there is a trial that the minutia of which exceeds anything we read about any trial in the publicity today. It is a year when we are yearning to know about people and we will need ourselves a hero. And the hero of the 20s will become Charles Lindbergh. Now many of you, I'm sure have already, you are readers, uh, and I'm sure many of you read Scott Berg's biography of Lindbergh. I found it a little bit uh, depressing, honestly. Uh, there are parts of it that I did not care for a bit. But it's not really true to say that he wasn't in the news, that Charles Lindbergh never made the news, 
before he got to Paris because he was clearly in the Nashville news uh, uh, before he took off from New York, from Roosevelt Field, and he had been he had been in the news in lots of other places. He was definitely considered one of the people who might compete for this prize, and there was a prize involved. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about his background simply because I find this really, really interesting. His father, actually, uh, Charles uh, A. Lindbergh, was a Republican U.S. congressman for a period of time, and I, I did not know that until I read the book. But it's really, uh, a, you know, it's very interesting to me, his father's uh, uh, birth here in the United States. The family name was Manson, and that's Manson with two S's, Swedish Manson. Um, the, the grandfather lived in Sweden. He had a wife and several children there, and he was a pretty respectable citizen there until he got bored with his wife and took a, a mistress a 20-year-old waitress, and they produced a child out of wedlock who happened to be Charles Lindbergh, the pilot's father, who became a U.S. congressman. As a result of this, uh, they decided to do what lots of people in Europe did, which is escape, start over, change your whole identity, come to the United States. And that's just exactly what they did. They came here, they uh, uh, got here in a hurry, they created a whole fantasy life. Uh, instead of Manson, the name became Lindbergh, which uh, uh, is the, a linden tree mountain, is what a Lindbergh is. They, of course, settled where there are other Swedes, and that would be Minnesota. Thank you, Garrison Keeler, for that information. Uh, we we uh, still uh, miss him uh, every Friday, uh, Saturday night, for sure. But they come here and uh, actually do start over. Now, his father had to take sort of odd jobs. In the beginning, he got a job in a sawmill, and fairly early on, he had this gruesome accident working in the mill, uh, which should have killed him, but miraculously, they stitched him up, got him back together, and uh, he, he survived the, the, I guess I would say he survived the treatment, but he was, he was cut very, very badly, extensive cut. You can read that too. Uh, and uh, he, he recovered from that. He will get involved in politics, and he will soon actually go to law school and become a lawyer. So he sets up an office, and um, they, ha they will have another child, but uh, here is little Charles. He is born to them. They have the, 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 the son has what, who we know as Charles Lindbergh. So here is young Charles Lindbergh. His daddy is interested in politics. The family is a very... Um, <coughs> I don't really quite know how to describe this family unit because they don't believe in any kind of physical affection whatsoever. They're very stoic, they're very unemotional in dealing with each other as we find out when his mother shows up when he's ready to take off on the spirit of St. Louis. And, and when his dad went to Congress, the family was back and forth between Little Falls, Minnesota, and Washington, D.C., so that he never really felt like he had much of a root in any places because the family was moving back and forth. Uh, he wasn't particularly a good student in high school. He uh, was interested in tinkering, pretty much like Henry Ford was, uh, he enrolled at this family, enrolled him, it would be a better way to say this, in the University of Wisconsin where he was planning to be an engineer. But the only way he was able to survive his freshman and sophomore year was because his mother wrote his papers for him. He had no interest. So as a sophomore, he flunked out and announced to his parents 
that he was going to be going to become an aviator. That was all he really wanted to do. Now, in 1920, anybody who tells their parents they want to become an aviator definitely raises some concern. It would be like one of your children announcing they wanted to be a NASCAR driver today. It was highly dangerous, but that was the only thing he was interested in. <clears throat> And at this time, there's not really a lot of interest in aviation here in the United States. You know, here were Wilbur and Orville Wright, who had come up with the airplane, and they marketed the airplane all right, but the market was in Europe. The Germans and the French brought, bought more airplanes before the Great War, the Americans just didn't see a military need, although we had some. We were not, our military was not heavily investing in airplanes at this time. But that was what he wanted to do. He wanted to be a pilot. A, he wanted to fly airplanes, an aviator. Cities in the United States hardly had an airport. We were so far behind Europe, uh, there were very few cities that had any place that a plane could formally land. You just land out in somebody's field. So, for example, Detroit in 1924 was the fourth largest city in the United States, and yet it had no airfield. San Francisco and Baltimore still didn't have an airfield by 1927. Now, that's the year Lindbergh's going to fly to Paris. St. Louis had Lambert Field, which it became the most important airfield in the country simply because of where it was located, sort of in the middle of the map of the United States. But also, it became a good airport, an excellent airport, because here was Major Albert Lambert, who was interested in aviation and thought that airports and airplanes were the transportation of the future. So he was willing to support the city getting an airport with his own money, which is what he did. He, he invested heavily in this. New York City had four airports in the area. Three were out on Long Island and one was out on Staten Island. They were all privately owned or run by the military and they had the most basic facilities. None of these airports had a control tower. And so finally, it's not really until 1925 that the United States begins to see the possibility of air transportation and especially for the public. And one of the people that really became most instrumental in the United States developing public air transportation and public companies was Dwight Morrow, a New York banker. He was very interested in flying, but he knew nothing about it. But he was interested in the technology of flying. So President Calvin Coolidge appointed him to be the chair of the president's aircraft board, a group of largely businessmen that were trying to address our deficiencies in air travel. So he uh, takes that and begins to promote it and push it. By coincidence, uh, in 1929, Charles Lindbergh, the American hero, will marry Dwight, Mar Dwight, Dwight Morrow's daughter, Anne Morrow. So, this is Charles Lindbergh. He wants to fly, and he is, a fl he is interested in flying. He is going <coughs> to learn to fly, and he is going to, to try to win a grand prize in flying. Now, we had some, the United States had very few known pilots in 1925 or 6. The world's most famous pilot was René Paul Fonck, a Frenchman who had, had distinguished himself during World War I by shooting down German planes uh, with great fervor and en energy. He was still regarded as the best pilot in the world. He 
seemed to have, in Bill Bryson's words, not mine, no common sense regarding preparations. He had no interest in uh, testing planes before he got in them and flew, and so he decided in 1926 he was going to fly across the Atlantic Ocean. He uh, doesn't test the plane, he overloads the plane, he packed extra fuel just in case we need it, lots of emergency equipment, two kinds of radios, spare clothes, presents for his friends and supporters, and, uh, lots to eat and drink, including on the plane with him, wine and champagne, <laughs> a, and he carried with him a dinner of turkey and duck to be prepared and eaten for him, by, eaten by him to be prepared for him on his arrival. So he was determined he was going to do this. And he was flying from New York to Paris, so I guess he really thought that even though he was French, his own people just weren't going to feed him. He was taking, taking food along. So he is determined that he's going to do this. Now when his plane left the ground, keep in mind, this is 1926, it weighs 28,000 pounds, which is a lot of weight, and guess what? It really wasn't able to lift. It was so incredibly heavy. Uh, it was just too, too heavy for him to get off the ground. So on September 21st, he's, he's a, a showman. He sells himself. You know, the French are the world's most elite uh, pilots. We uh, know airplanes. We know how to fly them. A pair of uh, fellow uh, Frenchmen had flown from Paris to Bandar Abbas in Persia, which said, of course, we are the best. We can fly long distances. So a crowd comes to watch him uh, take off, and he's going to need, because his plane is heavy, he's going to need an especially long run to get the thing up in the air. So down, down he goes, running in his plane down a... a more or less grass runway. Uh, and he is running down the runway uh, with the p crowd watching him, pulls open the throttle, is gaining speed, but he's just almost fast enough to get the thing in the air, but not quite. <laughs> Everybody holds their breath. He's at the end of the runway. Surely he's going to stick the nose up and take off. It never lifted off the ground. It tumbled off the runway over a 20-foot embankment out of sight. There is a crowd there watching this spectacle. There is stunned silence. And then a huge explosion. How can anybody walk away from such a calamity as this? 20, uh, 2,850 gallons of gasoline aviation fuel had combusted. <sighs> Amazingly, Falk and his, his uh, navigator escaped, but he had two other crewmen who were incinerated in this fire. It was a financial disaster. It horrified the flying world uh, like nothing could. The plane had cost over $100,000 to build, and uh, it was burning there in a ditch at the, uh, beyond the runway, and it was a disaster. Uh, he needed to pay his backers back. He had no money to do this. So, you know, this really kind of, kind of calmed people down about trying this for a while. It makes people nervous. It's a long flight. Nobody's ever done it. And we're flying with uh, really primitive technology. Raymond Ortigue 
is a businessman. He owns some hotels. He is very interested in aviation. And as I said earlier, the Americans love competitions. And so he, in 1919, after World War I ended, offered a prize of $25,000 to the first pilot, the first team that could, say, could fly a plane from New York City all the way to Paris, France. Well, nobody had taken him up on it, and now we've had, until now, and now we've had this terrible disaster. Well, that's in 1926. The disaster has taken place, and by the time all of this happens, it's too late in the year for an airplane to even consider taking off because you're going to fly this upward, you know, sort of up the Newfoundland and that northern route, you're not going to go straight across, and the Atlantic weather was going to pro prohibit any flying. It would be far too dangerous for anybody to take off. Spring of 1927, uh, we suddenly start hearing about this prize again, and we've got at least two really legitimate teams, and then this pilot, this single pilot, who might have a chance, or might, I guess I should say, rather than have a chance, I guess I should say, were, were willing to try it. They were willing to try it. So here is team number one. This team is the plane Columbia, and it is a very experienced pilot, uh, uh, Clarence Chamberlain and Bert Acosta. Now, they are being uh, funded by another New York businessman, uh, and uh, they, they will have some challenges in dealing with his personality because he uh, has a lot of ideas and he also wants himself to be uh, front and center in all of this activity. So they are going to get they're going to try to fly the plane, and they make their announcement known. It is published that they're going to try it when the weather gets better, possibly in the spring. Now, their backer, Charles Levine, was an interesting New York character. He was a businessman. He had uh, made a fortune after World War I in taking... Uh, uh, those brass bullet cases that had been used and, and essentially being in the recycling business and they were recycled for the brass and he wanted to fly with them. He wasn't a pilot but he wanted to fly and the, so people called him the flying junkman. But he was, he was also, you know, he and Chamberlain just, although they were flying his plane, he, they did not get along at all, and he is, he is really quickly ready to rid himself of them because he just does not think that they are, uh, that they want to get rid of him, he wants to get rid of them, and so this, the personalities of this situation are going to be doomed. Now, the uh, bird, the, the second contestant here, is uh, uh, Lieutenant Commander, Richard Byrd. He had already known for supposedly getting to the North Pole, whether he did or not, you'll have to make the decision. But he, he was an experienced man. By all accounts, he was a great guy. He was very gracious when Lindbergh did get to Paris. Uh, he was uh, fairly fearless. He also was well-trained. He had lots of experience. He was from a very well-to-do Virginia family. He had uh, a good backer in the person of Rodman Wanamaker, who had department stores in Philadelphia and New York City, and he had a very nice plane. The plane had been designed uh, 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 by a German who said that he didn't really support Germany during the Great War. So figure that out, I'm not sure. Uh, he said he really wasn't on Germany's side. But the uh, uh, German was himself sort of a self-promoter, and he promoted himself and the, the superiority of this plane here. And then there's the, there's the 
um, in, that's the, the, uh, the uh, German who designed the plane. And he was also a, a very respected pilot. And then third here in all of this is somebody that people just think, well, this guy will not be able to make it. He can't do this in any way, shape, or fashion. He's poor, relatively speaking. He's by himself, and his plane looks like it will barely lift. It's so lightweight, it's not much better than some of the things the Wright brothers jumped off of uh, the cliff at Kitty Hawk with. So people don't really hold him as a, a serious candidate for the Ortig Prize. But he's going to get into the race here. And he really did have a lot of experience flying. He just didn't have a military record because he was younger than the other uh, contestants, so to speak. Had, but he had gone to flight school, uh, such as flight school was, in the early 1920s after he left the University of Wisconsin. He learned to fly. And as many pilots did, he became a stunt performer. So he was up there in the high skies doing tricks and doing stunts. This is what pilots did. There was no real commercial uh, public flying from one point to another. So he was out there flying his plane, doing all manner of dips. This gives him a tremendous amount of experience, at least in mobility and how to handle the plane. He also, the most lucrative job for a pilot, was carrying nothing but the U.S. mail from one place to another. And mail, air mail, quickly became very popular because uh, it, was, it was so quick and uh, actually uh, more reliable in some cases than uh, mail that was carried over land in some kind of a conveyance. So he is capable of some foolishness. I think, you know, as a stunt pilot, you got to have a certain level of this. But really, he is kind of a dire, a dour young man. Uh, people don't know much about him. He seems to be kind of a loner. Well, he's a stunt pilot trying to impress people, and he had gone down to Texas to uh, uh, do a show. And he decided in this little town, Camp Wood, that he was going to take off by driving his plane right down Main Street and lifting off. Now, of course, Main Street in any rural town in America had lights on either side, telephone poles. The wingspan of his plane was 44 feet. The distance between the pole on the north side of the street and the south side of the street was 46 feet. You've got a foot on either side to spare, so you better be good. Well, he's speeding down Main Street. He hits a bump. It causes one of his wings to tip, clip a pole. The plane spins sideways, goes through the window of a local hardware store. <laughs> Uh, not neither Will Lindbergh nor any of the spectators, which there were a lot out on the street that day, were willing, were, 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 were hurt. Nobody was injured here. Uh, and there is a reason why they call this guy Lucky Lindy, because he had done some things that were uh, quite dangerous, and he was lucky to have walked out alive. And, you know, the whole story of his flight to Paris I mean, he was incredibly lucky to have gotten there. So he had flown over 700 flights. He was largely self-taught. He decided to enroll in the Army Air Reserve. He took the training there, got the training, but they didn't have a spot for a pilot. He was in the Army Air Reserve. So he delivered the mail. He did a variety of things. Uh, he just wasn't well known. He was still very much a Midwesterner. But he wanted to try for the $25,000 prize. 
And he was really, again, lucky that he was able to get a backer that would actually finance his venture and pay for the plane to be built. He finds none other than St. Louis businessman Albert Lambert. He's going to back him, and so consequently Lambert recruits some other businessmen in St. Louis, and he names his plane, you know the name, the Spirit of St. Louis. So he's going to get this plane built. And this is, this is where he comes in contact with Mr. Levine, who is backing the uh, a Columbia, the, the first plane I talked about. He needed to get the plane built, and he wanted to buy one. Uh, Mr. Levine uh, had invested in some airplanes, and he owned this plane called the Columbia. So he, Charles Lindbergh, wanted to buy this plane from him. He goes to New York City. They meet in the Woolworth Building. What a beautiful building it was in the, the day. Uh, and they uh, seem to be talking about a great deal, $15,000 for the Columbia. They, that's really astonishing. Uh, and it's also astonishing that Charles Levine was making this deal with Charles Lindbergh when he had already promised Chamberlain that it was his to fly across the Atlantic. So essentially, <clears throat> what he does is he says, oh yeah, I'm going to sell it to you $15,000. So Charles Lindbergh goes back to St. Louis to get the check. No credit cards in those days. He goes back to get the check from Lambert comes back to New York City with the check, and Levine would not take the check. Uh, he reserved the right. He would sell him the plane, but he, Lindbergh, reserved the right to pick the pilot. And it's not going to be you, Charles Lindbergh. It's going to be Chamberlain. So here goes Lindbergh brokenhearted, back to St. Louis with no airplane, and he's got to figure out somebody who can build him a plane and build it quickly, because we've really got to get our plane off the ground in late spring. We, we only have a small window when the weather is going to be safe enough for us to do this. So he goes back to St. Louis and finds a tiny little company out in San Diego that will make him a plane, Ryan Air. Nobody had ever heard about it. He wants them to build him a plane that can withstand flying across the Atlantic Ocean. He meets with Mr. Ryan. Mr. Ryan and his tiny little staff really need the work. Uh, they are looking for work. Charles Lindbergh tells them he needs it within 60 days, and they tell him they'll build it for $6,000 plus the cost of an engine to put on it. So for the next two months, Ryan and his workers worked to exhaustion. He ended up having 35 workers working on this one plane to produce what became known was as a Ryan M2. They produce this plane I mean, by any descriptions, it is something that nobody in this room would even consider flying from here to downtown Franklin, let alone across the Atlantic Ocean. Let me tell you what the plane looked like. It, it was, or what it was in it. It looked pretty lightweight, and it was. It was definitely not the state of the art. The pilot flew it with the stick to uh, maneuver it, to steer it between his legs. Uh, it had no fuel gauge. Lindbergh didn't want one because he didn't think fuel gauges were accurate. Now, I can assure you the one in my car is very accurate. I have <laughs> tested it out. But he didn't need a fuel gauge. He had no brakes on this plane. This is what they made. They made a frame of wood and aluminum, and then they covered it 
with Pima cotton and painted a kind of heavy varnish on it, coat after coat after coat. So you've got to have it lightweight, and putting this varnish on this cotton makes it shrink and stick to the frame they have created. I find this pretty unbelievable. And there's nothing, nothing there to protect the pilot. Nothing whatsoever. Six coats of this uh, a varnish like substance go on it, and only the nose of the spirit of St. Louis is actually made out of metal. Everything else is a uh, uh, very flimsy material. Uh, nobody knows how this plane's going to work, but they hope that it can get from California to New York so that it can be flown in the contest. Some said that it was no more than a flying gas tank, that here was Charles Lindbergh who had made so many compromises and, and this plane was going to be hard for him to just maneuver. Charles Lindbergh himself thought his greatest problem in flying across the Atlantic Ocean was not going to be flying the plane no matter how good or lightweight it was, he thought his biggest problem would be falling asleep. So he was not so worried about the plane, he just hoped he could stay awake for this. Only the engine was of a new design, and it was a Wright J5 Whirlwind. For all of you air uh, uh, plane uh, enthusiasts, it was the state of the art. It was air-cooled, lighter and more reliable than water-cooled engines. It would work. Uh, it had been the kind of engine that was on the plane that Richard Byrd had flown uh, when he flew to the North Pole, whether he did or not, but when he made that journey that became the trip to the North Pole. So he tests, Lindbergh tests out the spirit of St. Louis. Uh, he practices in it for a little while in California. He likes the plane. It's agile. It's fast. He can get it up to 128 miles an hour. Uh, and he really thinks that this plane is a successful uh, investment, that it will work. Well, then he gets word that the Columbia and the America, which are already on the East Coast, are ready to take off too. So he's going to fly his plane across the country to get it. Now, he will stop, but he's going to fly it across the country to get it to New York uh, just to get into the competition. And it's, a ra it's not a race. It's not three planes leaving at the same time. It's just whoever can get there first is the only uh, requirement of this. And, and 1927 is a year of weather history in the United States. Some of you I know have read that book about the Mississippi River flood of 1927, Rising Tide, in which the whole Mississippi River Valley ended up being flooded. President Coolidge sent Herbert Hoover to Memphis to try to deal with the flooding and it made Herbert Hoover a potential presidential candidate uh, the next year in 1928. Charles Lindbergh gets his plane to, out to Long Island. He lands his plane at Curtis Field. The other two are over at Roosevelt Field. And he's, he's pretty, feeling pretty good about this. He, the others don't think much of him. He's kind of vague. He's not really one of the competitors here. And then he suddenly gets very uncomfortable because the thing he never seemed to have considered in all of this was publicity. And people are beginning to hound him, reporters, for information. And they're asking him questions that growing up in this very restrained household where as a child he shook his mother good night, shook hands with his mother to tell his mother good night, you know, he is very uncomfortable with these people asking personal questions like, do you have a sweetheart? Uh, you know, and, they, and he just, he, he then gets a little bit unnerved about what he has gotten himself into. The questions 
uh, don't have anything to do with flying a plane. I mean, this is the age of tabloids, for goodness sake. People want something they can write about. Do you like to dance, Mr. Lindbergh? What do you like to do besides fly a plane? And these reporters were just trying to make the guy look normal, and he was really determined that he did not want his privacy invaded here. So among the many things, there's the spirit of St. Louis after the flight. It had to be completely rebuilt because uh, it was uh, uh, vandalized after the flight. His mother shows up in, Saint Lu uh, in uh, Long Island. She shows up at the airport to wish her son goodbye, and it's awkward, and the reporters are there to capture this awkward moment on camera because they are certainly not going to do anything to show any great affection for each other. And one of the uh, composer graph photos, which I could not find, but there is a photo of them with different, with their heads on different bodies uh, showing some affection for each other. But this is, a, you know, this is an unusual pair to begin with, and I really think that this may contribute to some of the things in, in Lindbergh's later life. This may be responsible for this. So everybody's ready to go. It looks like it's going to be a three-way race. And Lindbergh looks like he doesn't have a chance. But what Lindbergh doesn't know is the other two are having a whole lot more trouble than he is. For one thing, the uh, 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 Mr. Levine and Pilot Chamberlain have had a real out and out. He uh, does not like them. They do not like him. He says he's going to put two additional pilots on the plane. That would be four. The plane only has room for three. Who's going to give up their seats? What's going to happen here? And so Acosta, one of the co-pilots, is just totally in disbelief. He walks off and goes and joins Bird's team instantly. Uh, it is a huge mess. The weather the week of May 14th could not have been worse in New York City. A tornado actually touched down in May of 1927 in Washington, D.C. Thursday night, Charles Lindbergh was going to a movie. Uh, it was as much as anything just to get away from the airfield and to act like he's doing something semi-normal, go to a movie. He goes off to a movie, but he decides before he gets, gets out and leaves that he'll check the weather, which you do by calling. He makes the call to check the weather to see what it is, and what he learns on Thursday night is the weather is bad, it's foggy, but it's going to clear the next day. So he turns around, goes back, gets his plane moved from Curtis Field to Roosevelt Field. It's going to take half the night to get the thing full of fuel. It takes so much time. He doesn't get the plane to Roosevelt Field till 3 a.m. in the morning. It is drizzling. He, he has had very little sleep. But at a little after 7 a.m., Charles Lindbergh, gets in the cockpit of the spirit of St. Louis. Now the runway, such as it is at Roosevelt Field, is full of puddles. It has been raining. You've got to deal with that. And uh, Bill Bryson described going down this runway it, with it wet as like driving a vehicle, a bicycle, or a plane on over a mattress. It was so squishy. <laughs> The field was so bad, but he is determined to take off. <laughs> and he has virtually no visibility. It is foggy. It is sort of clouded in there, but he is determined to do it. He takes off, lands, doesn't, comes back down, doesn't get off. Tries a second time, takes off, land. Now there's a crowd out there watching this. Uh, a bird had gotten cold feet himself, and he was, he was not going to do it. He was going to christen his plane on Saturday, and he wasn't leaving till after Saturday. I think that's one reason why Charles Lindbergh wanted to go ahead and leave. But the third time, the plane finally 
lifts off the ground. It was so slow, it looked like it was up, but it wasn't going to be able to clear a telephone post right at the uh, pole, right at the end of the runway. It finally takes off. Now, I have to say, Richard Byrd was very gracious when he heard that Charles Lindbergh had gotten to Paris, and he said, his takeoff that day was the most skillful thing I have ever seen on the part of an aviator. He is a wonderful boy, and he was just a boy. The spectators on the ground were totally silent. There was no cheering. They just didn't think he could make it. Here he is in a fabric-covered vehicle taking off. Well, now, you know how this story is going to end. It is a 33-hour flight. He uh, is in every newspaper when he lands in Paris on, on French time Saturday night at 10-something p.m. He's been up in the air for 33 hours, and this is the route he took. The only thing he made, and he wrote, he wrote a, about this later in his life, about the journey, and he made every one of the landmarks he needed to make getting to Paris. He could find them. He could see them. He reported that sometimes he flew as low as 10 feet above the ground. Sometimes, perhaps, he said, 10,000 feet above the ground. He got to Paris on Saturday evening. He sees the Eiffel Tower. But then, of course, where is this airfield where I'm supposed to <laughs> land my plane? It's northeast of the city. Well, uh, which way is northeast? He sort of takes off in that direction, he thinks. But then he sees down below him thousands and thousands of light. Because with him circling the Eiffel Tower, everybody in France suddenly knows, guess who's coming? <laughs> and uh, so people get in their cars in Paris and go out there to this airfield to meet him and greet him. And it is, by all accounts, pure chaos, pandemonium. When he stops the plane, these people like you and me get him out they're carrying him across the field and he doesn't like a lot of touching keep, keep in mind he does not like a lot of touching and you know he he was completely befuddled by the size of the crowd the american ambassador will meet him there in the I, I won't call it a terminal, I will say the reception area, the office of the airport. He will go to the ambassador's home uh, where he will eat and sleep. The flight will be certified over the course of a few days. He and the plane will return to the United States where he will be greeted as a hero like no other hero. There, here we are in France. The, the police were not able to keep uh, the people. People, people took souvenirs from the plane. Uh, there's some things on YouTube. Now, you all with a computer, there's plenty of views of Charles Lindbergh flying on YouTube. Uh, and he has his own, there is a charleslindbergh.com website which has some audio about this. This was the news all over America. This was the hero we had been looking for. People were thrilled. And how did people learn about this? They turned on their radio on Sunday morning and heard the details on their radio that the spirit of St. Louis had landed. Thank you very much. Great story.